Hi, welcome to CTN Member Highlights. I'm Leslie McVeigh, and I'm here today with member WMPG in the studio with Jeremy Alderson. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, pleased to pleased to be talking to you. Thank you. Well, Jeremy's the coordinator of the Homeless Marathon, the no, director. No, no, no the... director. My title is far more exalted. I'm the director. Oh, well, uh, that I just sounds... don't wear a ring so you don't have to kiss it. <laughs> now, uh, Jeremy, you've been doing this for 19 years. Were you the brains behind this uh, event? Well, I, I really wouldn't claim to be the brains because it really has to depends on whether you think it's a smart thing to do or not. You know, I mean, I've been hitting myself in the head with a hammer for so long. I don't know, no, don't know what's left up there. But the short answer is yes. So why did why did you start doing this? You know, it it was never my intention to do this more than once. I had been homeless. I had a very mild form of homelessness, but I spent a year couch surfing uh, back in the early 80s. It's not something you forget. That was traumatic in itself. And uh, of course, if you're out on the streets or something, it's much, much worse. And I was doing a radio show um, on WEOS in Geneva, New York. And during that um, show, I was, for years, I was covering homeless issues. And then uh, my station manager said that there was extra time. I could, if I wanted to do a longer broadcast, I could. And I just thought I would spend the time on something I really cared about. I Practically nobody heard the first broadcast. Honestly, it stank. I didn't think it was any good at all. I, I mean, I've, I've never even listened to it again because I got, oh, that was embarrassing. But the funny thing was, uh, people really liked it. People really were supportive, and it's a concept, it turns out, you know, that, that everybody understood. You're going to go out, and you're going to talk to homeless people and be out in the cold, which we were at that time, and, and, and dramatize their plight and let their voices be heard. Everybody was behind that, no matter how badly I did it. But after that first one, I got the idea, okay, I'll do it again, and I would like to say we've done a much better job ever since, but we got our feet wet that first time. Now, you travel to different parts of the country yes. to broadcast this. Yeah. Um, how do you choose those cities? It's, it's no one way. It's, uh, it's a combination of factors, just like anything else. You know, of course, we, we want to have a radio affiliate there that we can work with. We want to have uh, access to homeless people there. Uh, so if, if the place is in the middle of nowhere, we, we have no one to talk to. Um, and uh, we would like to also be someplace where we can highlight some aspect of what's going on with homeless people where there's some issue to, 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 to look at. So, you know, you put all that in the hopper and you kind of sift through and, you know, you just kind of make a decision. It's not, there's no magic to it. Now, you've been working with Jessica for a number of years here at WMPG. Mm -hmm. um, and is this the first time you've chosen Portland as a city to broadcast from? No, actually we were originating from Portland in 2003. This is the first time we've ever been back in the same city twice. But we're doing something different this year. Usually what we do, our standard format, which is for do, to broadcast first of all for 14 hours, which we're not doing this time, only four. And uh, we put our booth, we put a broadcast booth out on the street, someplace where there are homeless people. We either close off a street where homeless people might be or we're outside of a shelter or wherever we would be. We, we choose different kinds of locations. And then we know that the homeless people are there and they talk to us and we spend the night freezing depending on where we are. But this year we're in the studio and, the, uh, and we'll have homeless people in the studio. But the um, most of the homeless content will come from correspondents around the country in Phoenix, in South Dakota, in uh, Los Angeles, in San Francisco, all over the place. So are there examples of mistreatment at the hands of the authorities that you can cite? Uh, yes, all the time. Uh, you know, whether it's a public building and somebody's just trying to sit someplace, it uh, doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're a little kid, sitting with your mom because you can't find a place, uh, any shelter in Philly, they will chase you out of there. So over these 19 years, what have you seen change as far as the, the questions or the um, concerns of the people who are living on the street? I'm not sure their concerns have changed at all. Their mm -hmm. concerns are very immediate. They're, they're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. But 
our concerns as a society or my concerns for this society have really changed a great deal. Um, people ask me, what have we accomplished? And the answer I always give is that the combined efforts of all the homeless advocates in the country for 30 years have just seen things get worse and worse. We're moving backwards. And something that people really don't understand at all in this country is that the de facto homelessness policy of the United States today is to assault homeless people and destroy them if they can. Homeless encampments are... Um, uh, rousted, torn up, the belongings of homeless people are thrown away so that people will lose if you got nothing and you lose your tent or your sleeping bag or worse, your ID so that you can't get, if you have a veterans check or a social security disability check, you can't get it or you lose your medication, things that can take months to, to regain. And this is what now city after city is doing. And this cannot be an accident because they all get their money from HUD. I'm not telling, saying that HUD tells them to do this, but HUD has the power to say, we don't like the way you're acting. And HUD does not do anything. After years and years of, of advocates telling HUD, you can't let this keep going on, HUD finally relented. And they have a 200-point a system where they evaluate how cities get money for their various homeless programs, of which there are many with acronyms and so forth, but, you know, housing or whatever it is, rapid rehousing or supportive housing and so forth. And um, out of that 200-point scale, the question of criminalization, the question of if you, you do harm to homeless people so that you shorten their lifespans, that gets two points. That's 1% of the total, 1%. Now, if you go and you kill somebody and you go to a judge, that's not 1% of your sentence. That's the thing. And no one should be under any illusions. When you take away the means of sustenance from a homeless person, you are very likely dramatically shortening their lifespan. You are putting them at severe risk. And HUD simply doesn't care. The federal government doesn't care. And, and after pressure from advocates, all they've done is wink at it. This should not be going on. It's a disgrace. Taking away everything, the, the very little they have to hold on to. Very little. Even also, also they throw away like your last picture of your dead mother or something. They just throw, they don't care. Yeah. They treat homeless people like they're not human beings. And it's it's heartbreaking, it's shameful, and I think that the reason, a lot of the reason it goes on is that most Americans just don't understand this is how it really is. Right. I think you're right. Well, we're now in the Disc Library at WMPG with Carolyn Silvius. Hi, Carolyn. Hi. Now, you just told me you were formerly homeless. Yes, for a period of 10 months, which seems like an eternity. <laughs> well, and tell me what that was like and, and how did that come about? Well, it came about through a misunderstanding. It was just a series of a mess <laughs> and ended up uh, when I first became homeless. My daughters took me in alternating between their apartments and whatever, uh, between their homes, actually. And uh, but both of them were very overcrowded. <laughs> OK, and neither of them really had room for me mother-in-law in the house is never a good idea, but the main problem was that every time I would look for an apartment and I would say, I'm homeless, they'd say, oh, you're not homeless, you're living with your daughters. Mm -hmm. Services were completely unavailable as long as I was with them. So we sat down, the three of us, had a nice long talk, and said, they said, Mom, you're not going to get anywhere until you're actually physically in a shelter, and I agreed with that. And so after Easter, they brought me to Florence House shelter, and that was a little scary because I had never been homeless before. I had no idea what to expect. Fortunately, I fell in with some of the most wonderful people. Uh, Florence House is a spectacular shelter. Uh, the food is fabulous. <laughs> the people, I was in, a, in, in with a bunch of people all in the same boat with me. We all understood each other. The other residents tried to be as kind and as possible. It was, it was really, it was an experience, and I learned such a great deal about homelessness that I never knew before. And Florence House is for women only, right? For women only, yes. Right. So that was um, a little bit 
easier to accept, perhaps. Yes, perhaps. yes, yes, it was. Um, the other shelters that are co-ed are scarier, much more dangerous. Florence House is able to protect its clients, and uh, it's a great deal of you know, privacy kind of thing that they give you from the outside world. And and being with other women in the same situation, women kind of bond with each other in in a lovely way. Sometimes, yes. It wasn't a great deal with that. It was, when you put 40 women in one room, oh. okay, oh. there are going to be fights and arguments <laughs> and whatever, yeah. and that's always something you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, these ladies were wonderful to me. And the staff is spectacular. They went bent over backwards to help me in any way they could. So what did you have to do in order to get housing eventually? Well, um, I applied everywhere. But the housing situation in Portland is at the stage where the demand is so great that you go on waiting lists and waiting lists and waiting lists. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they notify you when you're fifth on the list. That could mean you've still got six months to go, you know. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Is it up to you as the person waiting to keep checking back? Absolutely, but the staff there will also help you with that. So uh, they are very good. So they make sure you don't get forgotten. Mm -hmm. The One of the things that really astounded me when I got to Florence House was the number of elderly people there. Uh, homelessness affects the elderly as much as it does the young. Um, there were, oh God, at least a third of the population of the shelter was over 55. Mm. Some, there were two ladies there at Florence House at the time that I was there, I uh, st think they're still there, who were over 85. Oh. Uh, this is not the way to spend your senior yeah. years. Uh, over the years, you've met a lot of homeless people all over the country. Sure. Has there ever been a movement in any of the cities or collectively across the country to create their own shows on public access, radio or TV, to have an ongoing uh, forum for discussion of what they're dealing with and, their, and what their needs are and what people are doing to help them or to work against them. Yes, there have been. And I think actually this is one of the very few th things that have come that I can point to. You know, when you do radio or television, you don't know who's listening. You may have inspired someone and you hope it'll bear fruit. But in terms of the tangible results, every now and then some radio station or somebody starts a show where they deal with homeless issues because we kind of show them, well, you know, you can actually talk to homeless people. It's, it's not a problem, you know, <laughs> they're accessible and so forth. And, and, and there have been these kinds of efforts also independent of us, and there are people who are organizing. There's homeless rights organizations all over the country. But that said, it's, it's not so much. It's kind of few and far between. I'm now with Jessica Lockhart, the program director at WMPG. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Leslie. How are you? I'm fine. I'm really glad to be here. Now, the first thing I did when we were setting up here was try to move this camera, and everyone said, don't touch it. Why is that? So we are doing a radio broadcast, but we are also doing a video, a live video feed. Um, USM is providing uh, our, the cameras, and we're going to be, you can see this radio broadcast if you go to YouTube. So it's the 19th annual Homelessness Marathon. We've been doing this 19 years. And today is the 19th. So it's pretty cool. That's yeah. really cool. So 19 years, and you've been involved the whole time? I've been involved for about uh, 10 years plus. Uh, Jeremy Alderson started this, and uh, here at WMPG we said this is unbelievable about 10 years ago, 13 years ago, and we started carrying it. And the, the marathon goes to different cities, so we're so excited it's here in Portland this year. Yeah, it's huge that it's here. Right. I, I was confused by that right? because I thought you were just doing a, a segment here. Right. We always broadcast the, the marathon over all of these years, um, but that's maybe it was over in Cincinnati. Maybe it was in California, and we were just taking their signal. But now we're sending the signal to all this, the radio stations around the country. And you've actually traveled to some of these cities. Do you 
travel every year? Yes, I'm a, I've been co-producing this program because I believe in it so much. And with my position here at MPG, I felt I could reach out to other program directors to say, hey, why don't you, you know, air this program like we're airing it? So. so when you do this every year, what's the feedback from your audience? Well, the feedback, we get lots of calls during the show. And um, it's great when we hear from uh, people from Maine that we know our listeners are listening. Feedback, I think, is our mission is to give voice to people who don't get a, a voice on regular radio. And a lot of people say that they appreciate that we're airing this uh, once a year special. Yeah, it gives people a little insight in, as to what the homeless people in their neighborhoods right. are, are dealing with. Yep. yep, it's a tough situation. We love that we get a chance to actually talk to homeless people, hear their stories, and it's going to be exciting tonight because we're going to be asking them about what do they think about uh, President-elect Trump. You know, tomorrow, uh, you know, we're broadcasting this the day before the inauguration, yeah. so live. And so it's going to be an exciting night. And to let them have a voice about what their concerns are right. re regarding the new administration. I think it's wonderful. Right. So yeah. we're happy. We're just really happy that we've got a chance to do this. It's a big deal here for WMPG. Yeah. Well, it's a big deal for us to be here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> you mentioned that over the last 19 years that you've been doing this, that things are getting worse, mm -hmm. not better. Right. Has there been a direct, you know, sort of scale line going up to being worse, or has it been up and down depending on the year or the administration? Because you've no, been I would say it's a pretty one-way street. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, one of the reasons we do this show is that a lot of what you hear about homelessness is just disinformation. You could be living, a, you know, listening to the Ministry of Truth in the Soviet Union. The, the HUD does a point in time count every year where they show how many homeless people allegedly there are. You might as well believe in unicorns if you believe in that count. It is, uh, it is completely fake. Maybe the people who do it and the volunteers are well-intentioned. But there's a, a couple of reasons why it's not good, and yet it's creating an impression among people that maybe the numbers are going down. And First of all, because of all the attacks on homeless people, they hide. They don't. If somebody from authority comes around looking for where are you, so I can count you. They don't want to be found a lot of them. But the other reason why you know it's not right is that there's a second homeless count that's being conducted by the Department of Education. They have somewhat different criterion, um, a criteria they, which is that they consider people who are doubled up in the same apartment, like you've lost your housing and you moved in with your family. They consider those people homeless. And in, in point of fact, a percentage of the people who double up will eventually just be out on the streets, and a percentage will regain their housing, but they're all in a precarious situation. Why the Education Department cares is that even if they eventually regain housing, they tend to move first to this relative and that to relative, because you, you know people are not set up to take in so many people, and that interrupts education. Well, the homeless count done by the Department of Education of Homeless Children is skyrocketing. It's impossible for that count to be skyrocketing while the HUD count is going down. And the, in the Department of Education, they see the kids on a daily basis. They, so they actually know. Yeah. They're not dealing with people who are hiding from the man. They're really yeah. seeing it. So the HUD count is just plain phony. And that's one of the ways that we, we assure the public that we only, we, oh, there's nothing to worry about. And this goes back, if you go back to Ronald Reagan, um, I wrote my first article on homelessness back in the Reagan administration, and he was telling people, oh, uh, it's the problem is the homeless people don't know where the shelter is. There's plenty of shelter. There's not enough shelter anywhere, and even if I thought shelters were, were any good, yeah. it's just never been true. And then there's been a big move to make you think um, all the homeless people are, 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 are mentally ill, and it's because they got out of mental institutions and don't take their medication, or they're all drunks. This is also not true. Hi, I'm in the front office now at WMPG with the broadcast in the background and the telephone ringing and people coming and going. And I'm here with the advocacy outreach uh, person from Preble Street, Thomas Potosik. Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Hi, good to meet you. <laughs> it's good to meet you, too, because your job's really important. I like uh, to think so. Yeah. Um, can you explain to the audience exactly what you do and, and how you do it? Yeah, um, for the for the most part, um, 
I run a, a speakers bureau at, at Preble Street where we're really trying to get people who have, you know, personal experience of, of those struggles, be it, you know, homelessness or poverty, hunger, um, to, and we want to help them find their voice and be able to use their voice um, in, in, you know, Augusta when there are bills that we either want to support or, or try and fight against as is often the case, unfortunately, um, you know, and just get them comfortable with their story and, and just how, how important it is and how impactful it is um, and how necessary it is. Yeah, I think when people hear other people's stories, it just makes such an impact on them. Yeah, there's, you know, I mean, the, the numbers are, are useful too, you know, I mean, those, especially at, at the legislative level, I mean, there's some people that kind of need to, to see that, but, but the, you know, the numbers, the numbers don't have a, have a soul, you know, and they, and they, and they don't tell really the inside and, and the depth of, of the story, you know, and, and so any, any person, you know, that has that personal experience can talk, can speak from that personal experience, and it and it can be very, very impactful. And it gives us all a face to remember. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You're, you know, I, I, it, this is it's fascinating, and people do need to know what's going on. And I think this marathon is a great way to go about it. Thank you. Um, we're looking forward to hearing more as we go along, and really nice to meet you, and thank you for doing this here in Portland. Well, thank you so much, and if I may leave your viewers with one last thought, when you hear, hear the term homeless people, remember the operative word is people. Thank you. Thank you.